My name is Robert Pratt. I'm a senior judge from the Southern District of Iowa. That means I'm uh, no longer an active judge. Uh, I've been on the court about 22 years. And to say this is an intimidating topic for a lowly district court judge is very much an understatement. I have planted people in the room to come to my rescue. <laughs> and the people that got me into this uh, know that I believe that revenge is a dish best served cold, and I'm eventually going to get even. <laughs> so uh, here's what I've been instructed. Due to tight scheduling, we must begin and end on time, and so I've gotten uh, a timekeeper here to help me keep the uh, uh, event on time. Cell phones. Please mention that cell phones must be turned off or put on silent because this session will be taped. All panelists' phones should be turned off since their phones can interfere with microphone feeds. Twitter. If audience members would like to tweet about this session or their national convention experience, ACS's Twitter handle is at ACS Law, and the 2019 National Convention official has hashtag is ACS2019. With respect to CLE, please let the audience know that if they are seeking CLE credit for this session, the QR code on their name tag must be scanned at the beginning of the session by one of our volunteers. If they leave the session early, they must be scanned again so they will receive only partial credit. CLE materials can be found on the ACS Convention website, and further information about CLE is provided in the, in the program. With respect to questions and answers about the substance of our program, the microphone will be available. We're going to permit 20 minutes at the end of the, our discussion for questions. Please keep in mind uh, that your question should be short and actual questions. Now, I want to introduce, I want to introduce the following panelists. To my left is Elizabeth Wadress. Uh, as my former Chief Judge Richard Arnold used to say, she's a real lawyer uh, who actually appears in court and uh, litigates constitutional uh, claims. Prior to becoming president of the Constitutional Accountability System, uh, she served as the organization's chief counsel, representing the center as well as clients, including preeminent constitutional scholars and historians state and local government organizations and groups such as the League of Women Voters and AARP. She frequently participates in Supreme Court litigation and has also argued several important cases in the courts of appeal on a range of issues including immigration law, habeas corpus, and sovereign immunity. Previous to that, she was in private practice with Quinn Emanuel she was a supervising attorney and teaching fellow at Georgetown University Law Center uh, for appellate litigation. She served as a law clerk to the Honorable James R. Browning of the Ninth Circuit, and she was a lawyer at Pillsburg, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman. She's a graduate of the Yale Law School. Next to her is John McHale. John uh, McHale's research and teaching are focused on constitutional law criminal law, torts, human rights, jurisprudence, moral and legal philosophy, legal history, and cognitive science. Before attending law school, he received his PhD in philosophy from Cornell University and was a lecturer and research affiliate in the Department of Brain and, uh, Brain and Cognitive Science at MIT. He is the author of Elements of Moral Cognition, Rawls, Linguistic, Analogy, and Cognitive Science of Moral and Legal Judgment. He has published articles in a wide range of academic journals, including the Stanford Law Review, Virginia Law Review, Georgetown Law Review, and Law and History Review. After graduating from Stanford Law School, where he was the senior article editor of the Stanford Law Review, he joined the law firm of Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. He then served as a law clerk to the Honorable Rosemary Barquette, of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Victoria Norse is a professor of law and director of the Center on Const uh, Congressional Studies at Georgetown University Law Center. 
She is one of the nation's leading scholars on statutory interpretation, Congress, and the separation of powers. She's published widely on the power of the president and the separation of powers, most recently reclaiming the constitutional text from originalism, the case of executive power, 2018, and on constitutional rights. She has had a distinguished career in government up and down Pennsylvania Avenue in 2015-16. She served as chief counsel to the vice president of the United States. Prior to that, she served as an appellate lawyer in the Justice, Justice Department and special counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. She clerked for the Honorable Ed, Edward Weinfeld of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York and practiced at Paul Weiss. She then left private practice to serve as junior counsel of the Senate Iran-Contra Committee. She received her BA from Stanford and her JD from the University of California Berkeley School of Law. Editorial comment, she was she treated very shabbily by the uh, Judiciary Committee after her nomination to the Seventh Circuit. That's my editorial comment. Uh, <laughs> Bob Sy, Robert Sy is a professor of law at American University Washington College of Law. He teaches courses on constitutional law, the American presidency, and individual rights and liberties. In the fall, he will be the Clifford Scott Green Chair and Visiting Professor of Law at Temple University. He is the author of three books, Practical Equality, America's Forgotten Constitutions, and The Eloquence and Reason. His most recent book, Practical Equality, shows how past struggles over equality can offer lessons for <coughs> sidestepping obstacles to justice. He is a graduate of the Yale Law School and UCLA. After law school, he clerked for the Honorable Denny Chin, then of U.S. District Court of Southern District of New York, and now of the Second Circuit. Following his uh, clerkship with uh, Judge Chin, he clerked for Hugh H. Bounds of U.S. District Court uh, of the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. He has been a guest on Meet the Press, Morning Joe, and NPR. His essays appeared in Political, The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, Slate, Boston Review, and LA Review of Books. Last but certainly not least <coughs> is the Jed Hanselman Sugarman, Professor of Law at Fordham. He teaches torts, administrative law, and legal history. He is the author of The People's Courts, Pursuing Judicial Independence in America 2012, on the evolution of judicial elections and politics in America. He is currently working on anti-corruption emoluments litigation against the Trump administration, and he is writing about American prosecutors and the design of the federal executive. <coughs> he writes about law and politics at Sugar Blog. He has a BA, JD, and PhD in American history from Yale University, <coughs> and served as a law clerk for the Honorable John M. Walker, Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. I think we're very fortunate to have all of them here. The premise for our discussion this morning is about text. And the in your program, the following is the description. Some progressive scholars and advocates have long urged that progressives take up the mantle of textualism, arguing that, hit, that text history and structure of the Constitution lead to progressive results. This approach may meet with more support in the coming years as progressive litigators faced with an increasingly conservative federal judiciary seize upon originalist and textualist arguments in the hope of winning cases. Other scholars, however, and advocates contend that to concede any ground of the conservative interpretive methodology is to ignore its fundamental falsehood and forsake important constitutional interests. Is there a danger in signing on to the textualist and originalist approach to, the con to constitutional interpretation? How should progressives and liberals reconcile these arguments? Elizabeth is a lawyer who actually goes to court and does this kind of work on a pragmatic basis. Uh, what is the answer to the use of text in constitutional interpretation and litigation. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Judge Pratt, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to all of you for being here. And thank you to ACS for having me um, at this great panel. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you in the halls later humming, let's talk about text, baby. Um, anyway, <laughs> let's talk about all the good things and the bad things about text. Um, so yes, I, I think that absolutely 
progressives should embrace the text, history, structure, values of the Constitution. You know, certainly if you look at the document as a whole, it is a remarkably progressive document. We see the progress of our nation literally written across the face of the Constitution. We see America's ideals, America's original sin, America's redemption, America's hopes and dreams, our failures, our promise, all in this amended Constitution. I think the problem that we see from originalists on the right is that they sort of fetishize the 1787 Constitution, which, while at its time was a remarkably democratic document for its time, obviously was deeply, deeply flawed. But fortunately, we the people came together to make it a more progressive document. And so I think that whole Constitution which my organization, the Constitutional Accountability Center, promotes through litigation um, is something that progressives should and can and must embrace in litigation. And, you know, it's not quite so odd to be a progressive originalist, um, for lack of a better term. You know, we, uh, we have this great uh, uh, publication that tried to rebrand progressive originalism as new textualism. Um, we're still trying to make fetch happen on that front. Um, so I'll just say progressive originalism because that's how everyone knows it. Um, but you know, I, I think that that is something that has not in any way limited us from making arguments in support of the things that progressives care most deeply about. We've made progressive originalist arguments in court on behalf of the Affordable Care Act, on behalf of reproductive justice, on behalf of affirmative action, on behalf of voting rights. We have been able to make arguments across the progressive value sphere um, using progressive originalist arguments, mostly, I think, you know, um, drawing on the second founding, the reconstruction. But you know, to answer your question, I think that it's something that is in our arsenal and we should use it. Um, we shouldn't cede that ground to conservatives. It's something that, you know, you're the judge, so you tell me, but I, I, I have found that judges respond well to. Um, sometimes it's the only arguments to make. We represent um, nearly 200 members of Congress in the foreign emoluments litigation against President Trump, and there, there isn't any precedent. We're, we are making arguments about what the meaning of the Constitution is in that context, and fortunately we have prevailed thus far in the district court. Um, and so we will, yes, thank you. So we will see um, as we proceed. But, you know, it's something that judges respond well to. We obviously have to argue to the court we have with the Supreme Court. And, you know, um, we obviously have a conservative majority on the court. Um, I know we'll have some discussion about, you know, how, uh, how progressive arguments on text and history will fare in this court. But, you know, it's also an argument that resonates with the American people. And I think that that's one of the main areas where progressives should not cede this ground. Because you, know, you have this, as I mentioned, this very compelling story about our country and what it means to be an American and what it means to live here, um, both in, in terms both good and bad. And we have conservatives using that argument to their advantage. And oftentimes, we have progressives out here arguing about judicial method. And they're out here arguing about what the Constitution means. And think about how that plays to the public. Which one do you think is more compelling? I know we're you know, law nerds in here, so judicial method is something interesting to us. But when you talk about what equality means, what freedom means, what liberty means, what equal citizenship status means, that's something that's much more compelling than talking about uh, modes of interpretation. Um, not to say that it isn't a conversation worth having. Um, so the short answer to your question is yes, we should use it. And if we need to sage it out, you know, so like people aren't afraid of the word originalism, let's do it. Okay. Professor Sugarman, you, you've described yourself or been described, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, as a progressive originalist. When we use the term originalist and textualism, are they synonymous? And if so, why? If not, why not? 
great. I mean, it's, let me also echo Liz. I, I can't keep up with Liz's pop culture jokes. They're just too good. But I will, um, but I will say this is a terrific panel. It's been great working with different people on this panel um, on these issues, and I've learned so much from the people on this panel. Um, so let me talk a bit about the relationship between text and originalism and text and context. I would describe myself as an originalist, and I agree with Liz. There's a lot of progressivism in both the 1787 Constitution and the 1868 Constitution. Um, but I think that it's a commitment to a methodology that, will, that has particularly important progressive results for today. But I think we need to embrace it as a methodology uh, that is sometimes progressive and sometimes not. But let me give a, a couple of points about the importance of originalism. First of all, the invitation in the program talks about the, uh, the concern of, uh, quote, to concede any ground to conservative interpretive methodology is to ignore its fundamental falsehoods and forsake important interests. Let's, let me say some, one first thing about uh, the concern about uh, originalism's fundamental falsehoods. The concern about fundamental falsehoods is not an originalism itself. It's been the way that it's been practiced by justices and judges who have been using law office convenient history. So one observation about originalism is it's an invitation to do history, but to do good history, right? And so I think we need to embrace historical research uh, as, as well, um, with integrity. And I think that's the critique of originalism. It's not about originalism as a methodology. It's about bad originalism. So I think the more that progresses, and I think one of the concerns I have about the academy is that too many legal historians for too many decades abdicated and surrendered that territory to justices. And I think this was a massive mistake by the academy. We gave non-historian right-wing professors the opening to make bad arguments. And now I think we have many more historians that are engaging some of the most important issues today. So let me say something about the te relationship between text and originalism. Um, it, it, one thing I'll say is uh, it's important to recognize that the methodology of originalism is simply text and context. Now, who doesn't, who doesn't agree that it's important to look at law in terms of text and context? The second point I would make is that it's really about the weight. Now, some people who are originalists say that it's exclusively looking at text and context and the original public meaning. I would say those people are very convenient with how strict they are about text and context. No one is, a, uh, is an orthodox pure originalist in the same way that no one is an orthodox pure living constitutionalist in whatever, whatever goes you fly with, right? So I think I want to emphasize that text, it's, it's the degree of weight, it's the amount of weight that one puts on text and context. And I'll say that it's important to put a lot of weight on text and context. It's always <coughs> been important methodologically. But let me make one observation about the history of originalism. It didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of conservative circles as a movement in the 1980s to limit the discretion of what they perceived to be convenient uh, left-wing justices interpreting the Constitution conveniently. Well, lo and behold, 30 years later, those same concerns now are on the other foot. That shoe's on the other foot. What, the reason why it's important to stick to originalism is, first and foremost, it's the right way to think about the Constitution in terms of text and context. But lo and behold, it also constrains justices from voting their preferences and voting their uh, their ideology, regardless of the text. We have to be concerned now. Like, we, we just had a panel about court packing and v uh, various proposals for limiting the for, for changing the court. Those things are not going to pass Congress unless we win 56 seats in the Senate, right? So, and that's not going to happen. I'm sorry to break it to you, right? So, what? How else can we limit a a court that has been shifted to the right? Well, one is to say that this methodology that is meant to limit the discretion of justices, it was fair when conservatives talked about it. It's all the more fair for us to talk about it now from the left. So first and foremost, it's about the rule of law and I think limiting ju judicial discretion. But it's not just any kind of limitation of discretion. It's limiting it based upon the tenets of democracy. What's more democratic than nine justices, especially five justices whose appointments have been skewed by recent history, is to turn to a text that was ratified by we the people. Originalism is more democratic than let's just let the justices go with, with, uh, with their own ideology. Right? So it's, it's both rule of law and it's in terms of democracy. But just, Judge Pratt, let me take your invitation to talk a minute about text. 
one thing that we make we want to make sure that originalism is not just sort of reanimating a hall of presidents or you know, animatronic, oh, what would you do about cell phones or what would you do about gay marriage? That's not what originalism is. Originalism is the original public meaning, right? And so it's important to recognize when the founders, when the framers used narrow text and when they used open-ended broad texts. Right? So it's not just whatever expectations they had circa 1789, 1787. It's also looking at the choices they made. So historians have shown that in the, in the 1860s, when the Republicans added the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, they purposely used broad language like equal protection, the due process rights to life, liberty, and property, and the privileges or immunities clauses in broad language because they couldn't agree amongst themselves what limited purposes they wanted out of the 14th Amendment. They, as William Nelson, historian of the 14th Amendment, has shown, and as Akila Marr, historian of the 14th Amendment, have shown, um, these were invitations to future courts and, critically, future Congresses to spell out the scope of those rights. So if we think about text as whether text is narrow or broad, we need to see those as invitations, right? The last point I'll make about originalism is how meaningful it is, not just on what I'm saying about the 14th Amendment. So let me just say again, I think that the open-ended texts are capacious enough to leave room for Brown versus Board of Education and racial, uh, racial equality, and per perhaps through privileges and immunities and equal protection, reproductive rights and privacy, right? If, McCull if, if Chief Justice John Marshall could find a bank in Article I, we can certainly find rights to privacy in the Bill of Rights in the 14th Amendment. But the final thing I'll say is what we're facing as a country, as a crisis, is the dramatic <coughs> expansion of, of executive power. And if you want to set limits on executive power, just look back to 1787. That the 1787 Constitution has a number of ways through its text of setting limits on executive power. So just a couple of quick examples. One uh, is the emoluments clause that, uh, that uh, John McHale and I have been working on and Liz Wydra has been working on too um, as a litigator. So the emoluments clause is, is an anti-corruption focused on presidency, but the entire uh, uh, government. Number two, Julian Mortensen has an article coming out this month in the Columbia Law Review that is a tremendously thorough historical research to show that executive power was far more limited than right-wing justices have made it out to be. The executive power is just what it says it is. It's the power to execute statutes. And then third, I'll note that we have an article coming out this month in the Harvard Law Review, Ethan Lieb, uh, Andrew Kett and I, uh, called uh, Faithful Execution in Article Two. And what the original public meaning of faithful execution was, was a fiduciary limit drawing on hundreds of years of English and colonial legal history that imposed a duty on the president to newsflash, be loyal to the American people, right? To execute the powers, uh, uh, execute with care um, the powers um, of, of the office. And, and I think finally, to uh, be limited to the office in terms of, the, uh, in terms of faithfully executing statutes in good faith. All of those, all that wisdom in limiting the executive power of 1787 in its text is perhaps some of the most important lessons for today in 2019. So, do we all agree that originalism isn't so original? I mean, I, I think, Jed, at least that's what I get what you're saying. They made it up in the middle to early 80s. I'm, let me quickly answer. I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying okay. that the movement called originalism okay. was designed to be a rule of law limitation on what was on on liberal justices, right? What's and, and I think the same thing is true today. But I, I'm saying something I think uh, broader than that, which is the thing called originalism, coined in the 1980s, is really about fundamental methodology about reading legal texts, okay. text plus context. Okay. Bob. Oh. Go ahead, Bob. Um, Jed won't say, so I'll say it. Um, I do think that the, the project of originalism, and here's where I think I would, I would disagree, is a more recent project. Um, this is a project primarily uh, one that uses history in a particularly narrow way to constrain or limit uh, our very broad notions of equality and liberty, for example, as well as the, the, the broad language that empowers the federal government to take care of the nation's most serious problems. This is a project that is a, mo a more recent project. Um, and so I think what I'll probably be is the sort of uh, 
uh, I'll serve on this panel at least as the candy bar floating in the pool. In the, what is <laughs> otherwise a kind of kumbaya moment um, between uh, uh, conservatives and, and liberals. Um, uh, I, I'm much more of a skeptic about um, the utility of using originalism. Uh, as a as a progressive, I think than some of the other folks on on, on this um, panel, uh, whose work I admire greatly, um, uh, because uh, how I understand originalism as primarily a political project, uh, one of a more recent vintage, and I think the place to start is that uh, is that we have to understand that progressives uh, differ from conservatives and libertarians fundamentally in terms of our ends as well as our strategic posture with respect to the, the, the great body of constitutional law that's developed over the last 200 plus years. In terms of ends, um, progressives want the federal government largely to be powerful enough, strong enough to, to take care of the nation's most serious concerns, whether that's climate change or civil rights and equality for all Americans um, uh, or it's uh, other serious problems like that. We also want judges to be uh, able to play a role in safeguarding the most marginalized populations in this country, which they've been able to do uh, from time to time. Um, this is a very different set of ends than most social conservatives and libertarians. Um, they want, by and large, to be able to restrain the power of the federal government and restrain the power of judges to take care of these things. Um, and they're mostly willing to trade away um, uh, the the, the ability to sort of solve these kinds of problems or at least devolve those responsibilities to somebody else. Now, in terms of strategy, I think we're also in a very different place strategically, right? Um, conservatives and libertarians primarily are making the strategic calculation that a strict adherence to some form of originalism, however you define it, will get to where they want to go. Um, by contrast, progressives have much more to deal with. We've got, we've got, uh, precedents from the New Deal period, we've got precedents from the Warren Court period, we've got the occasional precedent that came from uh, the occasional Kennedy-led coalition, right, on the court that gave us material to work with. And we shouldn't give those up um, in any way by validating a very limited approach to the use of history. Um, so I think that strategically there might be moments when uh, we can join hands with the occasional originalist because our reading of history aligns. But we should be very, very careful about using history in a way that validates a very narrow methodology and I think the broader political project of constraining the federal judiciary. And um, I'll just close with one, one, one anecdote, and that is that um, just recently, right, you might have noticed that Justice Thomas kind of just uh, out, of, out of the blue on the First Amendment uh, volunteered that uh, it's high time to reconsider New York Times versus Sullivan, which has been a bulwark, right, of our, uh, of our First Amendment freedoms and our understanding that average people who don't have a major platform, that when they criticize a public figure, that sh they shouldn't be treated the same as Donald Trump or anybody else. And, um, and this is part of that originalist project, right, that Justice Thomas thinks that, uh, that uh, the proper reading through originalist lens of history means that New York Times versus Sullivan, as well as many other precedents, are wrong. Victoria. Uh, thanks. I'm uh, also delighted to be here. It's uh, unfortunately, uh, I've been at more Federalist Society panels than I have ACS panels. Oh, uh, this is where my home is. Um, and uh, that's because I'm an expert in methodology, so I'm always, you know, fighting Frank Easterbrook up there about the meaning of text. I've been doing that for 20 years on statutory interpretation, and that's why I'm very worried, along with Robert, about uh, any capitulation with respect to the notion of textualism and originalism. And I'll explain that by just clarifying what I mean, because I think a lot of times when we use these terms, we're, we're not being clear. I mean, I agree with the fact that Elizabeth's going to have to argue text and history. I agree with the emoluments work done by John. I agree with Jed, bringing more text into the picture. The problem is textualism is an ism. Okay, it's an ideology, and it's attached to originalism. So I want to make a, a distinction first uh, about why I think it's important to talk about text. So when Justice Kagan said that we're all textualists now, and one of my colleagues also wrote that before her, um, they're really conflating two opposite ideas. So when Elizabeth talked about textualism, she actually talked about what I call pluralism. 
And that's where liberals have been. And I actually think this is the founding ideology in Blackstone. We all look at text. We look at history. We look at the consequences of our action. Textualists in statutory interpretation will go, the damn be damned in TVA versus Hill. Uh, they don't look at the consequences. What does the text say? What does the text say? So pluralists look at all of the above. Call that all of the above uh, in terms of what they'll look at. And that's traditional. That's what we grew up with. Um, now, the movement, which begins in the 80s, is about abortion, because there's no text. <clears throat> and it transforms itself, but it's basically a conservative ideology to get rid of things like uh, abortion that uh, the Warren Court helped to create. Um, it's also there to get things like the right to bear arms. <laughs> so the text is the alpha and omega. It is a lonely textualism, right? It's not all of the above, looking at a lot of evidence, trying to do real history. Again, very important point that there's a lot of law office history. Um, helpful to have now folks, you know, like Elizabeth Schopp and John doing enormously good historical work. But the problem is that this is, these folks, I said it's an ism, they're believers, okay? They believe that the text will lead them to an apolitical result. Brian Garner has written this about the ABA journal. There's nothing apolitical about that. If it were, why could we have liberal and conservative textualism? It's because it's 6,000 words, a tiny, tiny economy of information. The country's history. Yes, I think these words are vessels of democratic experience. I would read them precisely the way that, that Jed and Robert would. But the textualism that I'm fighting, uh, and I think ACS should fight, is not what these folks are talking about. What they're talking, what the textualism is, is a reduction to 1787ism and 1787 dictionaries. And that's a problem because it gets rid of, ironically, uh, I was just down at Tulane giving a lecture and Stephen Griffin and I were talking about, ironically, it gets rid of a lot of history. I mean, what happened to World War II? What happened to women's liberation? Our fight to end slavery. I mean, these aren't social movements, as my friends at Yale talk about, but they are embedded in our vision of what a right is, for example, which was transformed. So I'm against a short, narrowed, blinded textualism because it's a one-trick pony. My husband told me, <laughs> the way I talk about it is like slicing and dicing of text. He suggested, since he's an internationalist, the word salami tactics <laughs> to convey what's going on, which was used in the Cold War to indict what Russia was doing uh, with uh, Eastern Europe, which is slicing off a smaller and smaller slice as if uh, of the pie, as if uh, not to be appearing to do anything enormously strategic, such as read a few of Justice Thomas' dissents. He is a devout textualist. So um, I think that focusing on text alone, 1787 dictionaries, is a threat and should be attacked. I think that the words cannot, in most cases, provide a definitive result. I've spent two years studying linguistics. I don't think any linguist thinks you pull one word out of any sentence, much less a constitution, and knows what it means. I'll give you an example I give to my students. If I say to this room, fifth, what do you think? Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. That's because you bring your context to the words. But if I'm in a liquor store, it's the size of a bottle. <laughs> we all bring our context to this. Why? That's why they're, the idea of limiting discretion, the rule of law, is fantastic. But as Lon Fuller said to HLA Hart a long time ago with the vehicle and the park hypo, you cannot do interpretation by focusing on individual words. What Fuller never explained, it seems to me, is how this tiny economy can be breached and how it can be translated, as Larry Lessig would say in his latest book, To Modern World. And I think all of us are trying to get there. What I'm trying to say is that there is an ideology of narrow textualism, salami tactics <laughs> textualism, that is a problem and that you'll have to, we have to fight. Why is it a problem? Well, for the very same reason Jed is concerned about executive power, so am I, and I've been working with ACS on this for a long time because in fact, Morrison versus Olson is, and the Scalia's dissent is a huge, um, it, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Um, why? Because in that dissent, Scalia wrote, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. As I described at the outset of this opinion, this does not mean some of the executive power, but all of the executive power. Of course, all is not in the constitution. That kind of interpolation, like, Fifth of gin versus Fifth Amendment happens all the time. Liberals do it, conservatives do it. We can't not do it, according to linguists. So these interpolations are actually the interpreter adding meaning. 
So I don't actually think it's possible, right, to do textualism with 6,000 words and decide things like abortion, contraception, and all of that. Yes, there are general words like equal protection. Yes, there are general words like good faith. And I would like those to be, to have a liberal take on those general words. The problem is that they're just not going to be enough to decide the case, but there are believers who think they do. So what's gone on with all executive power, which is an opinion which, you know, the Federal Society folks, they are devotees of this opinion. They believe this opinion should be enshrined in law under the unitary executive. There's a case called PHH. It is going to be Justice Kavanaugh's dissent, I predict, unfortunately, is going to carry the day, uh, and it's going to be the first step, no more independent agencies, right? Textualism has an end as an ism, right? Not looking at text in the way we're all doing it, but in the way it's been adopted by those who adopt public meaning originalism. Interpreters add meaning. They gerrymander the text. They'll pick one word as opposed to another. John McHale focuses on necessary and proper. Right? Why aren't we looking at that when we look at executive power instead of the word executive? Why are we slicing and dicing that one word out? Um, <clears throat> so I'm very critical of textualism from a variety of things, and I think it has everything to do with originalism in the sense that our colleague Randy Barnett has, and Larry Solom, who I teach with, um, have propounded on the other side. And they would say, public meaning originalism is different from Borkian originalism because Borkian orig originalism looked at intent. And when Jed said, let's do good history, you know, let's look at good stuff. Right, I agree with that. But where Randy changed was he wanted to look at the public meaning of words. And so there's an enormous amount of focus in his work on the meaning of commerce. He looked at all the different ways in which we use commerce. Well, guess what? When he gets up to argue the, manda the, the, the mandate case, what does he do? He adds existing commerce, right? Only be, oh, no one's existing in commerce with this individual mandate. Oh, of course, that's not in the Constitution either. So the problem with public meaning originalism is that the springboard is text. And the, the original move, the first move you do, is you focus on a set of words without any theory about why you're pulling it out. And once you've pulled it out, you just add your own meaning, whether it's liberal or it's conservative. And so it's not what it purports to be. We couldn't have liberal textualism and conservative textualism if, in fact, that weren't true. So I believe the true original method of interpretation goes back to Blackstone and statutory interpretation, and it is pluralism. It is the pluralism we all learned in law school. Um, and so I believe it's something as a method that uh, liberals and um, uh, progressives should care about, in part because they should care about looking at the consequences. One of the things that textualism and statutory interpretation does not do, they refuse to look at the consequences. The words are what the words say, just the facts, ma'am. And I think that's linguistic authoritarianism. Thank you. Let me also begin by thanking uh, ACS and uh, the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in listening to the judge's introduction uh, of me, I thought to myself that all of you probably reasonably wondered, who let the philosopher and cognitive scientist in <laughs> This is supposed to be a, a, a discussion of constitutional law. So let me tell you, I do teach constitutional law at Georgetown uh, and have for many years. And in particular, for the last five years, I've taught a seminar with uh, Dean William Trainer on the drafting and ratification of the Constitution. So that's a, an opportunity for us to take a deep dive into the founding uh, of, the, of the Constitution, the framing of the Constitution. And we're dealing with the 1787 uh, Constitution primarily, not the Reconstruction Constitution. And so I'm going to draw on that experience in making a few remarks um, today about our primary topic. Because I teach that course, my students are often intrigued, are you an originalist? And I'm often mm -hmm. asked that question because I write a lot in constitutional history and are, can progressives be originalists and so forth. My feeling about that question is it's not a very useful one to answer, should uh, progressives be originalists? because too much has to be explained about what originalism means. I need to hear a lot more from the questioner about what they have in mind when they are talking about originalism to even get a purchase on the question. There's just too many things that, that folks mean about that. But if the question is, should progressives be prepared to make originalist arguments, then I, it's an easy question. I think absolutely the answer is yes. That has to do with the current composition of the courts. Um, and the way litigation actually proceeds, and it's been the basis for the work that Jed and I have done on the Emoluments Clause litigation, for example, along with the work um, Liz and her organization have been doing. 
Um, so that's an easy question. Should progressives be able and prepared to make originalists, originalist or historical arguments? In that vein, I want to put on the table a couple of ideas that I think are unconventional, probably uh, I, I think may surprise you. Um, and it, again, draws on the experience of, of, of teaching this seminar for many years and doing a lot of reading in the area. I think there's a conventional assumption that the text of the original Constitution is unfavorable for progressives. That in some sense, uh, if one goes back there and tries to make textualist or originalist arguments, you're going to end up in a very bad place, an uncomfortable place for the kinds of arguments that you would like to make. I think that's a misconception. And I think that the main reason it's a misconception is because uh, many of the best, most fertile, uh, most progressive uh, parts of the constitutional text have been taken off the table. And all that we're doing is fighting over the leftovers. If you take any founding document and you start striking a bunch of clauses and then you say to someone, okay, now go be a textualist with the remainder. Well, it depends what's been excised. Uh, and so the question I think for us is, are we going to take a look at the entire original constitution and think about its potential? Uh, in this vein. And so let me just mention a few examples of parts of the Constitution that have been rendered virtually inoperative uh, as a litigation matter, but are in the text and have always been a thorn in the side of those who seek to narrow the power of the national government to regulate in the service of the general welfare. That's the sort of touchstone of, of, of what I'm uh, pointing to. I think the text, let me repeat that and elaborate. I think the text of the original Constitution has always been a thorn in the side of those who seek to narrow the scope of national regulatory authority. The sharpest pricks of the thorn include the preamble to the Constitution, the general welfare clause of Article I, the sweeping clause, what we refer to as the necessary and proper clause, but I'll circle back to why it was called the sweeping clause uh, of Article I. The jurisdictional grants of Article III, including crucially the power that's given to the federal judiciary to hear all, all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution laws and uh, treaties uh, of the United States. The treaty power, which is unqualified in the text, but of course um, has been subject to all kinds of attempts to limit its scope something that the human rights community has been on, in a defensive crouch about for many years. The Ninth Amendment, which refers to unenumerated rights, which you might think would be a source of uh, arguments for why human rights are protected by the Constitution. Uh, uh, but of course, that's been treated as an ink block or something that's non-justiciable. The Tenth Amendment, uh, the Eleventh Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. Let me circle back and say a couple words about a few of these, uh, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So the preamble, if you go back to the very founding of the country, the people who were most fearful about the operative quality of the preamble were slaveholders. And the reason had to do with the fact that the preamble laid out the broad purposes for which the Constitution was adopted. And it was understood at the time that uh, one of the plausible implied powers of the government of the United States was the power to fulfill its purposes. That's what James Madison actually said when he proposed the Bill of Rights. One of the reasons we needed the Bill of Rights was the uh, incredible discretion that was given to the Congress by virtue of the combination of the sweeping power uh, clause in the preamble. When Benjamin Franklin submitted the abolition petitions to the first Congress in 1790, he quoted two of the objects of the preamble and called on Congress to step to the very verge of its powers to promote the general welfare and, and, and provide and uh, the blessings of liberty. That was terrifying to slaveholders. And as a result, there was a concerted effort, both before then, during, and after, to basically write the preamble out of the Constitution, to treat it as just a matter of throat clearing or hortatory uh, uh, exercise, not operative. Well, that's a terrible uh, outcome for those who seek to identify and validate a power in the national government to promote the purposes for which the government was formed. Uh, but that's the state of play today very much um, as far as the preamble. So it's kind of a joke. It was a joke in right-wing circles when Don Verrilli, at the end of the Affordable Care Act, invoked the preamble, called upon the court to fulfill the purposes of the preamble. That was treated as kind of ridiculous. Um, but of course, he was in line with what Benjamin Franklin said, what Frederick Douglass said some years later, what FDR said after the 1936 election. When he 
likewise thought uh, and defended the view that the government of the United States is empowered to fulfill the purposes for which it was formed. The necessary and proper clause is critical in this regard because the necessary and proper clause explicitly gives to Congress the authority to carry into effect not only the foregoing enumerated powers of Article I, Section 8, but all other powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. Now, it's an intriguing and important fact that there are no powers explicitly vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States as distinct from departments and officers of the United States. Right at the founding, it was recognized that one plausible implication, therefore, from the text of the Constitution is that the Constitution vests unenumerated powers in the government of the United States, implied powers. And again, among those implied powers would be the power to fulfill the purposes for which the government was formed. And from that, it's very easy to derive, as FDR did derive, a power to promote the general welfare, full stop. Not a power to promote the general welfare by regulating commerce or by carrying into effect one of the other enumerated powers, but simply a power to promote the general welfare. That's been written out of the Constitution. We find very few progressives willing to stand up in court and make that argument. Maybe that's for good prudential reasons because it's so unfamiliar that judges are unlikely to take it on. But if we're really talking seriously about the original Constitution and what the text of the Constitution affords, that's an argument that has quite a lot of credibility and I think ought to be uh, in the mix. The last clause I'll talk about uh, specifically is the Tenth Amendment, which, again, very long history and I can only touch on a few points here. But it's precisely because the implied powers vested in the government of the United States, including the power to promote the general welfare, were conceived to be so large at the founding that <coughs> conservative and reactionary elements in the society, including primarily slaveholders, wanted to add this critical word expressly to the language of the Tenth Amendment so that the language would read not uh, powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or reserved to the states or the people, but rather the powers not expressly delegated to the United States are reserved to the states or the people. Three times in the first Congress, a motion was made to add the word expressly to the language that became the Tenth Amendment. It was voted down on every occasion. So it was clearly uh, contemplated and voted down. If we, that, if we look over the course of our history and see the arguments that, again, those who are seeking to narrow the scope of national power to promote the general welfare make in relation to the Tenth Amendment, they essentially read the word expressly back into the Tenth Amendment. And sometimes the courts have adopted this view explicitly. So if you go back to the child labor case, for example, Hammer versus Dagenhart, the Supreme Court of the United States literally puts in quotation marks a statement of the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution and it adds the word expressly. <laughs> the grounds on which the Congress was deprived of the authority to outlaw child labor at that point in time was a kind of a federalist you know, argument grounded in the Tenth Amendment, and the statement of the Tenth Amendment included a word that is not in the text, and in fact was voted out of the text on three occasions. And the last example I'll give is Shelby County, which was a repeat of the same phenomenon. So Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in that case, quite remarkably, if you think about it, uh, you know, before kind of getting into the meat of the opinion, he gives us one of these you know, mini essays on the history of the country and what the Constitution stands for. And he paraphrased the 10th Amendment, and this time he added the word specifically. So he said, you know, our touchstone here is the 10th Amendment and the rights reserved to the states, including this equal dignity principle that I'm about to articulate. And his statement of, and you can go back and look at this, his statement of the 10th Amendment adds that critical adverb. And what that does, so he said that the powers not specifically delegated are reserved to the states. What that does is, again, narrow the scope of national power, whether we're talking about the Section 5 of the 14th Amendment or the uh, uh, Article 1 powers given to Congress. Um, it's the same move over and over again. And so I want to suggest that we ought to disabuse ourselves of this notion that the text of the Constitution is somehow uh, against progressives, that really if we are making strong textual arguments, we are going to be um, fighting an uphill battle. I think it's quite the contrary. I think if, uh, the, the best reading of the history and the text, and also particular cases like those I've mentioned, would suggest that at critical points where it really matters, the Constitution is written capaciously, 
There's a recognition not only of unenumerated rights, but unenumerated powers. And that uh, the kinds of arguments, whether it's respect to human rights or implied powers to promote the general welfare that progressives like to make, are perfectly respectable arguments that one can make in light of the actual text and actual history of the Constitution. So I'll stop there, but I hope we have a chance perhaps to discuss some of this further. Well, Elizabeth, is it just, <clears throat> uh, as Jed and John suggested, is it just uh, good to get the history right and we win? Um, I kind of think so. You know, okay. like I would much rather have this fight over, you know, our interpretation of the Constitution, our reading of the Constitution wins progressive outcomes than to have a fight over, you know, my ism is purer than your ism. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, what John says is exactly right. If, if we actually look at the text, we win. And, and frankly, on, you know, I haven't heard anything that we have to give up if we argue from the Constitution's text. You know, we've made arguments in support of climate change regulation. The original Constitution created a national government capable of providing national solutions to national problems. Um, contrary to there not being a text for abortion rights, I think there's a text. It's more important, just as Ginsburg thinks there's a text. You can't look at the guarantee of equal citizenship in the 14th Amendment and think that that doesn't include the right to decide for yourself whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. You know, all of these things, access to courts, a strong judicial enforcement, as John said, if you look at the grants, jurisdictional grants, um, and the strengthening of the rights provided in the Constitution over time, you see a very strong right to access to courts. And CAC has made those arguments um, over and over again, even uh, in the context um, in the Padilla immigration due process case, which was very successful on that front. and. You know, in Shelby County, there was an originalist opinion. It unfortunately was in dissent by Justice Ginsburg, but it was a very powerful use of progressive text and history in support of voting rights. And so I think that that's where the fight should be. We should push back against this idea that, you know, the Constitution is only these parts that conservatives have sort of put into, uh, you know, the manifestation of what the Constitution means. The 14th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, the 26th Amendment, they are just as much a part of the Constitution. They are the Constitution. They are not some like afterthought. The amendments are part of the Constitution, just as much as what was there in 1787. The guarantee of sex equality, of race equality, the inclusiveness of the democratic amendments, getting rid of the poll tax. These are the Constitution, just as much as the Second Amendment, just as much as the Federalist structure in there. So, you know, we are the American Constitution Society. Let's take on this Constitution. Let's take on the text. Let's not run from it. You know, I get that originalism has like the stink of Ed Meese on it, okay? You know, <laughs> do we need to have like an exorcism next year of the word originalism? I don't know, but whatever we need, let's take it back. It's, you know, I, I love that, I love uh, Professor Norse's reclaiming the Constitution from originalism, but I would just say reclaim the Constitution. You know, we have these protest signs at CAC that are like good for every single protest that say reclaiming the Constitution, because we should do it, you know? And when you get the history right, it's not just rhetoric, it's fact, and that is so powerful. Sure, uh, I appreciate what Liz is saying, but I think I would amend it, you know, I would, not an Article Five amendment, but I would, I would uh, add an addendum that any methodology that only delivers some results that you like is probably not a rigorous methodology. Oh, sure, but I'm a litigator. I'm not going to like, be like, we lose. Absolutely right. But I, I think it's, I think I'll say, I, I say two things, though. I think that originalism will, ha will generate losses for the Democratic Party and progressives. And it has to, because it's but a like constitution. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Oh, uh, when Obama played uh, some games with when the ACA was supposed to go into effect for political purposes, that was not faithful, that he was not taking care that the laws should be faithfully executed. So Cy Lazarus would disagree with you. Well, so, yeah, there he so, is. So, <laughs> so, uh, so that was not following uh, Congress's uh, uh, way that it legislated just recently. Um, DACA, to be honest with you, might not be faithful execution of Congress. Now, I am in favor of legislation. Let me be clear. 
I would love for DACA to be legislation, but until it's legislation, Obama was not faithfully executing, not, not making, take, not taking care that the laws be faithfully executed. So I executed. disagree on that. I agree, um, I agree with Jed on that. I actually. Uh, so those are losses. Though, um, um, you know, there's a risk that substantive due process gets lost because it's a matter of textual oxymoronicness. Process and substance are we teach every we teach one else that they are a dichotomy between substance and process. Unless we like the idea of creating rights through substantive due process. On the so flip I totally side, disagree with that. okay, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, but the good news. So there are a bunch. I mean, I could go. I actually think the Second Amendment through the fourth, not because of the Second Amendment, but the Fourteenth Amendment. There's an individual right to bear arms through the Fourteenth okay, Amendment. Yeah. So, he, but but here's the flip side. Where's the privileges and immunities clause? Right. That was written out by justices. But the Privileges and Immunities Clause was supposed to be capacious, and what you lose from substantive due process as a matter of text or originalism, you should get back through privileges or immunities. And I completely agree with Liz that as a matter of equal protection or the, uh, with John and thinking about the Ninth Amendment, that you can at least you can make a more legitimate textual and original claim for the rights that we want in the Constitution. And there will be some losses, but I think overall, uh, originalism actually protects the things we care about for the most part while also fending off the greatest risk we see, which is an anti-1787 um, imperial presidency. Uh, I'm just going to point out that I think this, this uh, intra-progressive uh, debate just illustrates my main point, which is that uh, that's what uh, originalists hope happens, which is that uh, accepting their terms of debate will simply force the rest of us to fight amongst ourselves. Uh, but but here, here, here's what I'd say. Actually, I actually agree with, with, with Jed Moore that um, there's, there's quite a lot that the originalist methodology, if we embrace it uh, overall, uh, will mean that progressives will have to agree to give up. And uh, two come to mind, and I think that perhaps you might agree with me, is that that some right to bodily integrity, some right to family control, this is all the stuff that many Americans believe are very important in our constitutional rights. And I think part of what makes the constitu uh, Constitution today, which is a 200-year-old plus document somehow relevant to our lives, is that that has <coughs> been updated to include those kinds of rights, we would have to give up. Um, and um, my friends on the, on the panel have done terrific historical work on the provisions of the Constitution that really matter right now, the Monuments Clause, Necessary and Proper Clause. I just think that we can use those as litigators and as advocates without uh, pushing them through the filter uh, of originalism um, and, and, and forcing it through that methodology uh, because I do think we give things up. We give up um, the possibility uh, of these kinds of rights. And let me point out one other thing I think we also potentially give up. Let's call this the problem of spillover effects. Because, uh, and, th and this brings back sort of uh, Vicky's earlier point, which is um, that uh, originalism, or at least a part of originalism, isn't an academic project. It's a, it's a deep political project. And it's a political project that involves limiting the power of judges. And I think this part of it of the project doesn't care whether they're federal judges or state court judges. And I, and I think this is part of the problem of spillover is that there are quite a lot of people who are, would be perfectly happy with state court judges using originalism to limit state constitutionalism. We're at a moment now where most progressives, I think, if we're thinking clearly, understand that we've lost the Supreme Court of the United States, mostly for the next generation in terms of the most pressing things that you might want to accomplish. And that can be major redistribution. There's probably not going to be major development on, uh, on rights. We're playing defense on abortion uh, and other questions of, 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 of bodily control. Um, the state courts are one of those places where we can turn um, to get those things done. Even on notions of equality, the court has been bad for a very, very long time and shows no sign of getting any better. And state courts, again, are places where there has been some progress, and we've seen some progress. I'm going to point to the state uh, Supreme Court in, in the state where I grew up, Washington State. Washington State Supreme Court in recent, uh, within the last year, issued two dramatic decisions under its own state constitution. Uh, one, ending the death penalty. This is the anti-McCleskey versus Kemp decision, right? They, they looked at a, a study, a long-term study, on the racially um, unequal impact of the death penalty in the state of Washington. They said, relying on this study, unlike the US Supreme Court, finding this is intolerable, and, and uh, not only a violation of the equality principle, but also a violation of the state constitution's anti-cruelty principle. Another decision they, they handed down had to do with uh, imprisoning juveniles uh, uh, without, uh, for their lives without parole. Uh, 
And again, they did the right thing. These are two examples of non-originalist decisions. And so one of the risks of embra embracing originalism even just a little bit is that you're validating it as a way of, of getting decisions done. And there might be some state courts that are willing to embrace that ideology as well uh, in the way that they handle business. We'd be shutting that door inadvertently. Uh, just one more uh, add on to what uh, Robert has sa been saying. And to give a shout out to my colleague John and to Elizabeth and to Jed, Yes, it is necessary, as I think I said on the phone to y'all, it's necessary to make these arguments because the court, the court's ideology has changed, right? It is all about text. Text is the springboard to the history. If you pick the wrong text, well, you know, what's the history of the due process clause as opposed to the necessary proper clause as opposed to the Tenth Amendment? We've got to make the arguments that John is saying. We have to. They're in there. Just because the Supreme Court has been retrogressive for most of its history, and I think most people would agree with that. It's bought. We all know this from Mark Galanter. Why the haves always win. It's structured to prefer people with money. The system. They're repeat players. Businesses are repeat players. They win. So there is a political ideology, I think, that ACS has to push back on. Make these arguments. They're necessary, but it's not sufficient. Because should there be uh, a Democratic president, I would hope that Democratic president would come out with his own Mies document that didn't look anything like what the Mies document looks like that would fight back for the rules of the game. Because you play for the rules of the game, you win the game. And that game is now won in the Supreme Court for the rest of our lives. We have to do what Elizabeth is doing. We have to do what John is doing. But we have to do something more, which is push back, using different words, in my opinion, than originalism, on proper methodology. So we have to play for the rules of the game, too. Elizabeth, are, are people making in the district courts and the courts of appeals, the arguments that John articulated about the broad scope of the, quote, original Constitution? Yeah. I mean, you know, we certainly are in the district courts, um, as well as the courts of appeals and the Supreme Court. Um, and I, you know, if, if uh, Mickey can think of a better term, like, like I said, I'm all for it. We at CAC say text history and values all the time. It's not exactly a bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> you know, like I said, new textualism didn't really catch on. So, you know, no one likes the O word. So let's all come up with a new one. But the, the text history and values absolutely are being argued. You know, um, as I mentioned, and as we've had great amicus briefs from um, John and Jed, the emoluments litigation in the district court, you know, that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, these aren't just, you know, big academic Supreme Court arguments. You know, we're standing up in district court and making these arguments to get real things. I mean, we are moving into the discovery phase on President Trump's <laughs> foreign business entanglements because of originalist arguments. Mm -hmm. Like, that's something. Um, so, you know, and I think when we talk about marriage equality or uh, abortion rights, we're making these arguments in every level of the federal courts um, and also in some state courts. There was actually just a victory in Kansas in an abortion case where um, we filed a great brief that drew on the way that the Kansas constitutional equality right drew on the Declaration of Independence. And a lot of state constitutions actually have that. But um, because progressives haven't looked to these sorts of, you know, quote unquote, originalist arguments, they haven't been made as much for abortion rights in the state. So, you know, from state courts to federal district courts to the courts of appeals to the Supreme Court, we are making these arguments. And, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm an optimist, but I'm not naive. You know, I don't know that Justice Thomas, I think, frankly, he should read some of our originalist arguments and as an originalist vote our way. He hasn't, all, he hasn't done that always, obviously. But, you know, he has sometimes. He voted uh, with the progressives in a state preemption case that, um, allowed important consumer protection laws to be enforced at the state level. Now, would he have written his concurring opinion that largely tracked the CAC brief if we hadn't filed it? I don't know that, and I can't prove that. But I'm really glad that we made that argument, and I'm really glad that Justice Thomas voted that way. I wish he would follow the text and history of the Constitution where it led more frequently. But we got to make the arguments, and I think that, you know, I'd much rather be having even an intra-progressive debate but certainly a progressive conservative debate about the meaning of the Constitution. I was on like the lecture circuit with Randy Barnett all through the ACA fight. <laughs> you know, 
talking about how he's wrong about the meaning of the Commerce Clause, how he was wrong about the taxing power, who was wrong about the Necessary and Proper Clause. It wouldn't have been a very satisfying debate if I just said, your whole project is wrong. And more important, I got the better argument because I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> and Randy is wrong. <laughs> so, you know, let's debate it. Yeah. I want to amplify that point if it's possible. Randy's wrong. <laughs> uh, Randy is a good friend and colleague, but yes. I, do think he's, I do think he's wrong about a lot of things. So. Um, <laughs> We love but, you, Randy. <laughs> uh, I, I did want to um, elaborate on one point with respect to the Emoluments Clause litigation. Um, that is that the originalist arguments that are often made in these kinds of contexts, if you take a look closely at them, are bad arguments. They're weak, intellectually weak arguments. This is what actually happened in the uh, case of the Emoluments Clauses. So what, let's refresh our memories. Before President Trump was inaugurated, he held a press conference, he brought his lawyer out and he had stacks of documents and explained you know, what he was going to do um, to, to comply with the Constitution. He didn't say, I'm going to evade the Constitution. He, through his spokesperson, said, I'm going to comply with the Constitution. And uh, Sherry Dillon, his attorney, stood up and said, she gave an originalist argument. She gave us a quick and dirty originalist take on what the emoluments clauses meant and why the president uh, was not in violation of them or wasn't going to be. And the next day, or the same day, a white paper was released by the same law firm, Morgan Lewis and Bacchius. The authors of that paper included many former Supreme Court clerks, uh, uh, people who clerked for originalist justices, and they put meat on the bones. They kind of, you know, six, eight page, dense, uh, elaborately footnoted argument as to why the president was not going to be in violation of the emoluments clauses. Well, if you took a look at their arguments, they were bad arguments. They were weak arguments. Their evidence didn't support their conclusions. Uh, so for example, they were looking exclusively to one 18th century source to defend the view that the emoluments clause didn't encompass profits from private market transactions, uh, including those at the Trump Hotel. That source was, wait for it, the Federalist Papers. So you can go to the Federalist Papers and see exactly what those authors said in each and every passage. And the critical point was that none of the statements made in the Federalist essays uh, entailed the specific conclusion that the president needed for his argument to succeed, which was that the only meaning of emolument at the time was one limited to salary or payments derived from office or employment. The reason he needed that is, again, going back to the text of the Constitution, because the Foreign Emoluments Clause is a very interestingly worded clause. It uses the word any four times. You're hard pressed to find uh, another, there's one other clause in the Constitution, depending on how you count semicolons, which does that. But this is the clearest instance of the most capaciously written, expansively written clause in the Constitution. It uses the word any four times. In particular, it prohibits the taking of any emolument of any kind, whatever. And because of that, it wasn't open to the president to admit that some uses of the term emolument at the founding included profits from private market transactions. And because if he concedes that point, it's game over. And so they wrote this originalist white paper trying to deny that conclusion. And it was, you know, it was like shooting fish in a barrel to rebut that argument. You can, in 10 seconds, go to searchable databases that we all have access to, founding era materials, just plug in the word emolument, whether it's documentary history, the ratification of the Constitution, or founders online or journals of the Continental Congress, there are quickly obtainable thousands of instances where the term emolument is used, and then take a few hours on a Saturday morning and read them, and you'll find many instances in which the term is used to encompass profits from private market transactions. There's no good originalist argument that that is not one of the ways in which the term was used at the time, and that observation combine, combined with the text of the Constitution yields a uh, bad news for the president. It's an originalist argument, but again, re returning to the point I made at the outset, you don't have to decide whether you're an originalist to make the <coughs> argument. It, we can be pluralists and say, look, there are six different kinds of arguments we might make, and one proper subset of the, those arguments are historical or originalist arguments, if you like to label them that way. And so here's the argument. Go to the merits of the argument substantively, not what the label is. And I, so I'm, I'm actually probably closer to Robert than Jed on this point, although somewhere in the middle, perhaps. 
Um, it's a deeply interesting question, normatively, what's the proper way to interpret the Constitution? But in the rough and tumble of litigation, you don't have to decide that question. That would be slightly insane to, sort of, as a litigator, to hitch your uh, uh, wagon to, to some label like that. Just go with whatever the best arguments are at the time. And if you find yourself in a situation where the opposing side, or in this case, the government, the president, is making originalist arguments for signaling reasons, right? He wants to signal to his audiences, I'm an originalist, and his DOJ has been doing that over and over again. But, you know, hold, them to, hold their feet to the fire. Say, OK, fine. For present purposes, let's talk about history and text and originalism, if you like. Now let's talk about it. And sometimes, not always, sometimes uh, the evidence and the arguments will be very much in your favor. So I, I just want to underline that point um, as, as one takeaway. Just Jed's a small colleague, oh. Jed's colleague, uh, uh, Professor Teachout, has written a wonderful book called Corruption. It begins with the story, and Jed, you, your history uh, would help me here, but it begins with the story of Ben Franklin, uh, I believe, returning from France with a snuff box. <laughs> and at least Professor Teachout uh, suggests, and I, I cited her book in an opinion, uh, her book suggests that, that that was the origin of the uh, emoluments clause. Is, is she correct? Uh, she's correct about the significance of a debate at the moment about Ben Franklin. But part of what uh, John McHale and I have worked on with this emolument, with this historian's amicus brief, is that the c concern with foreign emoluments far predates this Franklin event. Mm -hmm. And in okay. fact, the Dutch, right, so the Articles of Confederation had an anti emoluments clause. The Dutch and the French each had their own rules. And this is part of the importance of good history, right, is to say, uh, uh, and, and Professor Teachout uses this moment, which is a great moment with people, you know, Ben Franklin, people have heard about that. But um, what she also does with some digging is to go back further. And so you know, just two points about her book. One is she was writing this book far, far before anyone was thinking about Trump Hotel. She was making a, a broad, purposive uh, argument about the entire Constitution, that the Emoluments Clause is one example of an anti-corruption principle. So part of originalism is not just to do what we're criticizing on this panel about a very selective, narrow picking out of a word or a text, but it's to think about how originalism is also about purposivism. What were the purposes of the 1787 Constitution? What were the purposes of the 1868, uh, of, of the 14th Amendment? And if you do that work, not just by uh, cherry picking dictionaries, as John suggested, or, or, uh, and, 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 or cherry picking a, a, a word like Vic was pointing out, or for example, you know, when the emoluments clause says uh, emolument of any kind, whatever, right? That, that, that's not what they meant when they put the word whatever in there, right? Um, you know, right, uh, uh, whatever. Um, it, was, it was, so if you, if you can do textualism badly, Yes. You can do originalism badly. You can do textualism and originalism in bad faith, right? The point here is to be, uh, as academics and lawyers, is to learn the methodology to call out when you see the bad or bad faith arguments. And I have enough faith in judges um, that they'll get it right. And one more thing about Morrison versus Olson. I think the best argument against about Morrison versus Olson is that Scalia is a bad, was a bad historian. He made bad historical arguments. The best argument for, for, for keeping the majority of Morrison versus Olson and fighting off this bad Scalia dissent is that he got the history wrong. Scalia was not a good historian. If you do it right, then you actually make sure that the vesting clause of the Constitution about executive power is, capacious, is limited to give space for new designs about prosecutorial power and to preserve independent agencies. I don't want to pile on uh, against Justice Scalia, but I'll just, um, I will. Go, yeah, uh, do it. Because uh, there's, you know, just a, another concrete illustration in that opinion. Um, Justice Scalia begins with a quote from the Massachusetts Constitution, <laughs> which is a statement, a broad statement of separation of powers. He says, this is kind of the heart of our understanding of government. Legislative powers shall never be exercised by the judicial or the executive executive, never by the judicial or legislative, and so forth. Almost word for word, that language was proposed to be added to the federal constitution by James Madison, and it was voted down. 
And it was voted down for good reasons, because many members of the first Congress recognized that there's a lot of blurring in our Constitution, the vice presidency, the treaty power with the Senate. It's, it doesn't really make sense. It's not a good fit. You can't have such a rigid, um, explicit statement of separation of powers in our Constitution. It wouldn't work. That didn't seem to bother Justice Scalia, right? Uh, a very natural inference would be a, a, a proposed addition to a document that gets voted down can't turn around and be used, you know, too strongly inferentially in how to construe that document. The, the more natural inference is to go the other way. The framers of the document didn't want that statement to be in the, in, in the, in the text. There are so many examples like this all across the board, both in Scalia's opinions, Thomas's opinions. I, you know, we could go on and on um, uh, in this way. I, I, I just think, um, again, it's reiterating and reinforcing the main point, at least as I see it, which is the history does matter. Um, getting uh, into, the, into the history and into the, 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 the details matters. I think it's sort of above our pay grade as non-judges how judges um, adopt, choose to adopt and incorporate the arguments that we make, either as academics or in, in public discourse. They've got many considerations of their own to deal with, and they'll figure out <coughs> what they can and can't do or do want to do and so forth. But that shouldn't hold us back. Just this kind of voice in your head saying, that'll never fly. They'll never take that on. I think that's an inhibition that we ought to discard as we're talking among ourselves. And we should have a full-throated conversation <clears throat> about the Constitution and all of its dimensions. And I guess the last thing I'll say is that there's another court that's relevant. And that's, of course, the court of public opinion. And I think it's undeniable that, in some sense, the American public is, is, is at least faintly and perhaps more so originalist. It's part of our civic religion, whether we like it or not. These arguments have purchase. They, they have weight. And so to be able to make arguments that inspire, to motivate, fully acknowledge the horrific sides of our history, our constitutional history, of course, slavery and, and um, treatment of Native Americans and, and so forth. There are a lot of really bad parts of our constitutional history and, and bad uh, parts of the text as well. But having that conversation in a way that hopefully can inspire and motivate people to be pro-constitutional rather than to swear off the Constitution. So here I agree completely with Liz. That should be part of our mission and mandate, at least as I see it. Here's what I'd like to pose to the entire panel. In 1986, the then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court described the idea that there was a private right to a firearm as a fraud, an absolute fraud. So how do we go, and I'm thinking bad history here, Jed and John in particular, but how do we go from the idea of it being an absolute fraud from a conservative Nixon appointed chief justice to a constitutional right that we get in uh, 2008? Is it bad history? Is that how we got here? Uh, uh, just yeah. two beats on. I yeah. also want to, I, I want to make sure you have time for, yeah. for audience questions too, yeah. but just a, a, a short paragraph on this. It's a, through a mix of bad history and good history. Unfortunately, Scalia had more bad history in that decision, right. but he reached the right result historically. The Second Amendment was not an individual right in 1787, 17, 1789. Uh, the, sec, the, the, the militia meant something clear, and, and you know, I think it's debatable, but I think history weighs in on a, uh, a more collective right. The key thing that was missed in Scalia's opinion is the significance of the 14th Amendment. I think it was maybe deliberate that Scalia didn't want to highlight the uh, the, 18th, the, the 14th Amendment. But what happens, and this is in, Bill, in Akilah Mars, this is part of what's in Akilah Mars' terrific book, The Bill of Rights, is that the 14th Amendment Constitution, the, 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 the radical Republican Constitution, was a dramatic expansion of individual rights. Not primarily about racial equality, but not limited to racial equality. Part of the concern was that freed slaves needed to defend themselves when Republicans were going to abandon them eventually. So the, the right to bear arms is not just a conservative issue. It's also about, the right to bear arms is also a concern about freed slaves being able to protect themselves against white terrorism. Um, it's also, the 14th Amendment is about the incorporation of the Bill of Rights to protect all kinds of people, uh, including marginalized minorities in, uh, uh, in areas where they cannot protect themselves politically, such as women and such as uh, LGBT people now, right? That's not what they meant or expected in the 14th, uh, in 1868, but it's the kind of extrapolation of the purposes of the 14th Amendment, um, practical equality. 
So we actually filed that brief um, in the Supreme Court, um, including uh, clients on that brief, such as Adam Winkler, who wrote a fabulous book that everyone should read called Gunfight on this. Um, highly recommend it. Um, and, you know, I, I like when I think about what originalism uh, doesn't get me as a progressive, <coughs> in a lot of ways, it's that's the only thing I can think of. But I make myself feel better because I think if you look at the history, particularly at the time of Reconstruction, you can get to reasonable regulation of that right. But um, certainly, I do think that the history of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and particularly that context of being concerned about the terrorism of Southern militias against people who had been enslaved is something that is extremely serious and is undeniable when you look at that. Um, but you know, I think that part of that gets to what we were talking about as a court of public opinion. Um, you know, there has been a remarkable branding <laughs> exercise of the Second Amendment. You know, um, as a constitutional progressive, it drives me crazy that in the public imagination, probably the part of the Constitution that most Americans, the average American who, do, who you know, knows nothing about constitutional history and scholarship and all that, has this idea of a Second Amendment right. That even if I think that you shouldn't have a right to a gun, or even if I don't like that you have a gun, I have to respect your right to have it. And it drives me crazy that we have this for the Second Amendment, and we don't have it for like the 14th Amendment. You know, the idea that I might not like something about whatever you're doing or whoever you are, but you have this right to equality that I cannot infringe upon because you are owed it by the Constitution. And so I think that the Second Amendment uh, partisans did a fabulous job of creating this public imagination. And I would like to put in a plug for us being able to do that for the progressive parts of the Constitution. We want to allow some time for questions. So if there are questions, please come to the microphone. Make sure it's a question. And who you who you want to direct who you want to direct it to. And I guess can you have textualism without originalism? So for instance, like John was saying, hey, there are all these words in the Constitution that people are ignoring. Um, let's read those words, let's write them down, but then why can't we then um, you know, acknowledge those words and then define them with reference to 2019 meaning as opposed to 1787 meaning or 1868 meaning or 1933 meaning. I, I agree with your uh, premise entirely. Um, if we think about the Bill of Rights and the, the, the text of the Bill of Rights, including the Ninth Amendment, it's um, a big assumption to make to assume that the rights to which those amendments refer have to be interpreted with the meaning that they had at the founding. Again, this is a historical question. Uh, there's a historical perspective on this question because many, many of the most important founders understood that there was such a thing as moral progress. They said so explicitly. They understood that future generations would have a better understanding of human moral nature, of things like justice and rights and so forth. And if you dig into their writings, you, you, you can see that they thought the text doesn't say explicitly that the extension or intention, the meaning of those terms, has to be locked in time. It just refers to the rights. And so I think that's a case where textualism and originalism, in some sense, come apart. Um, and, and the best interpretation of the text might well um, incorporate contemporary um, meanings. So you know, the, the, this is an old observation, Ronald Dworkin and others. The broad, uh, general terms of the Constitution, the references to justice and rights and equality and so forth. There's a lot to be said uh, about how those terms are interpreted, and that is ground that should not simply be funneled into an originalist, I believe, understanding. Another question? So it, it strikes me that a lot, in a lot of conservative textualists or definitely originalists, they don't actually care about what the Constitution says. They just want to win um, in a lot of cases. Um, so it, I wonder if being a progressive textualist and being a very rigorous one might be a, a method of unmasking that, so that when, mm -hmm. you know, when we're able to say, like, you know, that you're able to say, oh, look at how bad a historian Scalia was, or look at how you know, bad a textualist Thomas is now, or mm -hmm. whatever, it might help, even though it might never persuade Thomas, it might help to um, show the court of public opinion that you know what's really going on 
Yeah, as I said just uh, earlier, the unmasking project is necessary. You know, everything that John has said about the emoluments clauses and done all this research, it's absolutely necessary. The good history is necessary. The unmasking project is necessary. It's necessary um, and proper. Yeah, <laughs> and proper. And there is bad textualism, just to line this up. And it, and so, you know, just to give myself a plug about my, you know, I can give you, I teach my students to make textual arguments and statutory cases on both sides. It's very easy to do. Why? You have a limited information. So you end up adding stuff in, right? So why did Scalia write uh, his opinions on the Second Amendment? He locked off part of the clause. He just got rid of it. It's absolute gerrymandering of text. <laughs> so he was a bad textualist. And... You know, I wrote a book uh, called Misreading Law because he wrote a book called Reading Law, right? <laughs> so the, I'm all for the unmasking project. I just say moving forward, I think we also need to have another element of thinking bigger and not inadvertently adopting 1787-ish ideas by adopting the term, which has so many. It, it's so big. So I, I just wanted to add to what um, Professor Norris was saying. You know, I think that that is incredibly important. And, you know, you're channeling CAC's founder, Doug Kendall, when he founded the organization 11 years ago. He came up with the name Constitutional Accountability Center, you know, in part because he wanted to make our affirmative arguments based in the Constitution's text and history, but also to hold accountable those conservative so-called originalists who weren't being faithful to the Constitution's text history. He wanted to hold them accountable in the court of public opinion, even if we lost, um, and we hope we don't lose, but even when we do lose in the court. Um, the only thing I would just add here, just very briefly, is that I think this is a, this is a difference between text and textualism that has been mentioned mm -hmm. before. And this is a point that Victoria made earlier, but I think it's worth bearing in mind, right, that all of us on this panel, despite our disagreements, would all start with the text of the Constitution. Um, but I think most of us would recognize that it tells us very little in the most important and most politically salient cases. And so, and this is illustrated by the fact that you have two famous justices who are on opposite sides of the political spectrum, both of whom would have described themselves as textualists, right? Justice Hugo Black and Justice Antonin Scalia. They both describe themselves primarily as textuals. And I think that is a recognition of the importance of the, of the ism, but also that even if we recognize that there are uh, awful interpretations <coughs> of the text and we lop those off, we're still left with a reasonable range of interpretation of most of the provisions that we think are most important. And that's, that's really where the, the, the true and honest fight is over the meaning of the Constitution. This young lady just says that sign for me, it says stop. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody, uh, particularly our panelists, for their presentation. Thank you.